Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in the last lecture of EC 3400 Analog Electronics, we looked at differential amplifiers with ideal tail current sources. Of course, ideal current sources don't exist. You'll be building such things out of transistors. And in this lecture, we'll model the non-ideality of such a current source by including a resistance RQ in parallel with our current source, IQ prime. And it's the combination of the currents through the resistor and the ideal current source that gives us our actual quiescent current IQ. This lecture is going to build off of that previous lecture, so I recommend that you go back and watch it if you haven't seen it already. As before, I'm assuming that the circuit is symmetric, so these resistances are matched left to right, and that these transistors have matched characteristics. To exploit the underlying symmetry, I'm going to take this IQ prime current source and split it into two parallel current sources with half the current, and I'm going to take RQ and split it into two parallel resistors, each with twice the resistance. So I can rewrite the circuit like this, which allows me to take advantage of the symmetry. I know that each side of the structure is going to contain half of the quiescent current. So to figure out what's happening with the biasing, I need to short out the small signal sources, and then I can split this circuit into half and just analyze half of the circuit. Now, my Georgia Tech students are probably sick of me saying the word Thevenin at this point, but it really is incredibly useful to take circuits and put them into a common structure. In this case, the structure we usually use to analyze bias circuits. So I'm going to replace everything looking down this direction with a Thevenin equivalent circuit. To do that, remember that when we compute a Thevenin equivalent, we cut the connection here, so there's no current flowing. So the current IQ prime over two that's flowing here through the source, well, it's flowing here, and it means it's flowing up through this resistance of two RQ. So I can imagine that I have a voltage source here where what this is modeling is I'm starting at V minus, but now I have a voltage drop of IQ prime times RQ according to Ohm's law by multiplying 2RQ by IQ prime divided by 2. Now, I need to include the Thevenin resistance, and to get the Thevenin resistance, I get rid of the sources, so I open up that, and I turn V minus into ground, and I just see a resistance of 2RQ. And then I just have RE in series with 2RQ giving me this. So I'm going to write a Kirchhoff's voltage law equation coming from the left over there and going down to the bottom down here. So I'll need to talk about the base current and the emitter current. So I'm going to ask a question, which is what is the series of voltage drops going from ground down to this voltage here? So the voltage on the left, well, that's just zero. And then I'm going to subtract V minus, and now I have a minus sign here because I have the minus sign up here, my IQ prime RQ. So this voltage here is the voltage at this node. So I have a voltage drop of IB times RB, according to Ohm's law, then going to drop a voltage VBE. And this is a number that we traditionally assume something like 0.65 or 0.7 volts. There's nothing magical about that. That's just a common value that people have landed on where you get a decently sized bias current, but you also aren't burning out your transistor. So let me take this minus sign and distribute it through. And we'll also take VBE and move it onto the left-hand side here. And we'll rewrite IB as IE over beta plus 1. So now I have everything in terms of IE, and I can write this expression here. So let's look at a couple of special cases. One common special case is where you don't have a current source at all, just a resistor in the tail, in which case this term here disappears. 
Another special case we might consider is the case where you don't have resistance RQ. If we take RQ and let it go to infinity, all of these other terms wind up disappearing as we let RQ become bigger and bigger. The RQs that are left cancel, and I'm left with IQ prime divided by two, which was the emitter current in the situation we looked at in the previous lecture where we didn't have that resistance RQ. And once you have the emitter current, you can multiply by alpha to get the collector current and divide by beta plus one to get the base current. The collector current is handy for making sure we're in the active region. So we need to check to make sure that the voltage at the collector is bigger than the voltage at the base. So the voltage at the collector is going to be our power supply voltage V plus minus whatever we lose with our collector current flowing across RC, which is just IC RC by Ohm's law. And our base voltage is going to be whatever our voltage is out here, which is just zero minus whatever voltage we lose going across the resistance RB, which is just going to be IB times RB by Ohm's law. And to find out what the bias voltage at the output is, well, that's just the voltage at the collector, which we've already computed. So you may capacitively couple this to some other stage, or you might actually use that bias voltage to set the bias voltage for the next stage. Note that because of the symmetry, I'm not bothering to do things like write numbers one or two in here in the subscripts. Now, just the bias currents are sufficient for computing most of our small signal quantities, but to compute R0, you do need the voltage between the collector and the emitter. And for that, we can just compute the voltage between the collector and the base and add to it our assumed voltage between the base and the emitter. Now, of course, for the transistor to be in the active region, this voltage between the base and the emitter needs to be positive, but we're just assuming that. Now with those bias currents and voltages, we can compute R0 and our other small signal parameters Rpi, Gm, and Re. Of course, when it comes to Rpi, Gm, and Re, I can write any of those quantities in terms of either of the other quantities, but depending on the particular application in the circuit, one of those may be more natural. Now in an integrated circuit application, you'll always have an active source down here. But there's a lot of cases where you have discrete pairs of transistors forming differential amplifiers where you don't actually have an active current source. You can set IQ prime in the formula is equal to zero, and you just have this resistance RQ sitting here in the tail. So all of the formulas we're looking at can handle that case. Sometimes this kind of circuit is referred to as a long-tailed pair, and that terminology dates back to the vacuum tube days where you wouldn't use any active sources down here, but you would use a very large resistor for RQ. And sometimes you might indicate the size of that resistor by making it really long in your schematic. Okay, let's look at the small signal circuit. I open up IQ prime and I take all of my power supplies and I turn them into AC ground. And so now I just have that RQ sitting there at the bottom of the circuit. So if I knew the collector currents, I could multiply them by RC to figure out the small signal output voltages. So I could go to Marshall Leach's website, click on the BJT formula sheet, and use the Norton equivalent circuit looking into the collector. And for that, I would use these big GMs, but I think it's actually easier to get to the currents that we want by computing the emitter currents. So I'm actually going to use the Thevenin equivalent circuit that Marshall Leach derived for looking into the emitter of a BJT in terms of the Thevenin equivalent seen looking out of the base. There's two equivalent formulas for RIE. One of them involves RPi and the other involves RE. In this case, RTB, the Thevenin equivalent resistance seen looking out the base, is just RB because I short VI1 here when computing an equivalent resistance. So I can replace everything up here 
with two Thevenin equivalent circuits and draw something that looks like this. And if you've watched the previous lecture, this should look familiar. If I didn't have RQ here, then this would look like a slide that I had in the previous lecture, but we do have RQ. So I'm going to approach this using the idea of superposition. Let's suppose that we zero out VI2 to focus on the effect of VI1. Well, if I want to know what IE1 is, that's just this voltage going across a resistance to ground. What's that resistance? Well, I have RIE in series with RE, so I add those together. And then what do I have? Well, I have a parallel combination of RQ and RIE and RE that you see over here. So that first term is just Ohm's law. Okay, now to focus on the effect of VI2, I'm going to zero VI1. Well, I have a current flowing out of VI2, and that's going to be given by this same expression here. From the point of view of VI2, it needs to produce a current to go through this complex set of resistances to ground, but again, that's Ohm's law. But I need to know what's the contribution of that current to this particular branch with IE1. So I need to perform a current division operation, and in a current divider, what you put in the numerator is the resistance of the branch that's not the branch that you're studying. So I have an RQ in the numerator. Also note that my arrow that I drew up here by the voltage source, that's running the opposite direction of the arrow for IE1, so I need a minus sign here. And in case you're wondering, this is the most complicated kind of analysis we're going to do as far as your standard amplifier forms goes. We'll get some complicated things when we look at feedback amplifiers, but those are all basically combinations of these other amplifiers that we've looked at. So by symmetry, I can write what IE2 is by just exchanging the roles of VI1 and VI2. Notice that if I look at IE1 and IE2 individually, this formula isn't balanced. I have this RQ over RIE plus RE plus RQ factor sitting here on one of the voltages. Okay, now that I have the emitter currents, we can easily employ the equivalent circuits for looking into the collectors. So substituting those circuits in for all the stuff down here, I wind up with a diagram that looks something like this. Now, one thing that's a little complicated with using Marshall's models is that it's not the case that you get IC1 as in this current here by multiplying IE1 by alpha. Under the approximations that Marshall is using, we wind up with the setup where multiplying alpha by IE1 gives us this IC1 with the SE in parentheses here. It's this current source here that's in parallel with our IC. Now, if I have IC1SC here, I can multiply it by this parallel combination of RC and little RIC in order to get the voltage. The one thing I want to be careful with is to note that I do need a minus sign here because this is pulling current out of the node. So substituting alpha IE1 in for IC1SC, I wind up with this expression here, and I have a similar expression for the output on the right. Okay, so there are two formulas for RIC that are in the notes of Marshall Leach's website. One of them is on his formula sheet. There's another one given here that's in the notes that isn't on the formula sheet, but he tends to use it a lot in the notes, so let's go with it. Anyway, in order to use this formula, I need to know the resistance seen looking out of the base. And we've already talked about that. That's RB. I also need the small signal resistance looking out of the emitter. So let's talk about that for a second. So let's see, I would need to zero VI2 here. And then I would wind up with a series combination of RE with a parallel combination of RQ and RIE in series with RE. And we saw a similar expression earlier when we were computing the gain. 
Note that if we let our Q go to infinity, this basically disappears, and we wind up with the same expression for RTE we had in the previous lecture. Anyway, here's what the gain formulas look like with the current substituted in. Notice that if we let our Q go to infinity, then RIE and RE here get swamped by RQ, and I wind up with RQ over RQ, which gives me 1. So this whole thing here winds up simplifying to this. This goes away, and then I have two RIEs, and then I have two RE's, which gives me this. So these formulas match what we found in the previous lecture. So if all you cared about was the final result, the previous lecture wasn't technically necessary, but as you can see, this was a pretty hairy derivation. So I think there's a lot of pedagogical benefit from seeing the simpler case where we don't have RQ first. So the output impedance is just going to be RC in parallel with RIC. So that's simple enough. And the input impedance, well, we need to think about where we're going to take it. I'm going to take it looking into RB here. So I'll have RB in series with RIB, which is the input impedance seen looking into the base of this BJT. And here's the expression for RIB. It's R pi plus RTE times 1 plus beta. And we've already computed RTE. If we replace the circuitry on the right with the equivalent circuit seen looking into the emitter, we wind up with something like this. And zeroing out VI2 because we're computing a resistance, I wind up with RE in series with RQ in parallel with RIE plus RE. So we've already computed that, which gives me this expression here. And again, if we let RQ go to infinity, then these RE's combine, giving me 2RE, and that matches the expression for the input impedance I found in the previous lecture. Before we go, I wanted to mention another way of interpreting differential amplifiers. If we come in this direction, going from VI1 to VO1, you can think about that as a common emitter amplifier structure. And going from VI1 to VO2, you can think of this as being like a common collector amplifier cascaded with a common base amplifier. So that's just another way to envision it. The last thing I wanted to mention here is that I have a series of three lectures on differential pairs for vacuum tubes, if you're interested in that kind of thing, as part of my guitar amplification and effects class. And I analyze those differential amplifiers using Thevenin equivalent circuits that I developed for vacuum tubes, inspired by the equivalent circuits that Marshall Leach developed for transistors. To my knowledge, I'm the only person to analyze tube circuits in this fashion.